Coming up, California is now implementing extreme sex ed curriculum in classrooms, mandating LGBT sensitivity for teachers, forcing pastors to embrace LGBT, working to require all colleges provide free abortion services on campus, and it's all coming up next on The Dr. Duke Show. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Duke, and this is The Dr. Duke Show, and every week Katie and I cover those stories impacting K-12 classrooms and college campuses around the world. Greetings to all of our listeners, and if you haven't done so, as always, please subscribe to The Dr. Duke Show audio podcast on iTunes and everywhere else. It's absolutely free. It's the best way to support the show, and again, it's free. Later in the show, we'll be getting educated on the nation's third president in our award-winning presidential minute series featuring Thomas Jefferson. And Katie, you know that... The more the progressives are outraged by a historical figure, the more significant that figure is. And Thomas Jefferson, TJ, is at the top of their wet their pants list. So stick around for that. And uh, we also know that we've got some questions coming up from our audience. And so we'll let Katie introduce that. Next week, we're going to have our office hour segment return because it was such a hit the first time around. So if you have any questions about education, top vacation destinations, because it's summertime still, or simply how to pair a fine wine, we're answering them all. Of course, I'm not drinking right now, and really, I'd, I'd be able to pair a fine latte better than a fine wine. Anywho, simply visit freedomproject.com slash askduke and submit your query. We had a great time answering them last month, so again, make sure to visit freedomproject.com slash askduke to have all your problems solved on next week's show. And speaking of big shows, we are dedicating today's show entirely to the dysfunctional plague-ridden virus that is the state of California. This entire show is going to be about what California is doing to education, what California is doing to our children, what California is doing to common sense, to the rule of law, to everything under the sun that is good, decent, and wholesome. The barbarian hordes of California next in the Dr. Duke Show. And our first story is California's implementation of a radical extreme sex education curriculum. Now, we, we have been talking about this in pieces for a long time. We've brought you many, some of our, our biggest hitting shows, the ones that have uh, resonated the most, the clips from the shows that have done the most viewing, ha- have been seen by the most people, have been California related. So all in one place, you're going to get your dose of California here. And uh, so we've talked about the sex ed curriculum before, uh, but now we've got some more information about it. This California Board of Education implemented progressive sex and gender education curriculum in public schools now across the state, regardless of parental knowledge or even parental consent. Progressive groups, including Pan Parenthood, lo and behold, collaborated on California Bill AB 329 is back in 2016, but it's all weaponized now. It's all implemented and weaponized. The Death Star has been built. And the recently introduced health education framework. Both of these pieces of legislation now mandate, mandate, should we change that to person date? It should. And we're going to come back to that in a little bit in the sh- later in the show, too. Uh, this, both pieces of legislation legisl- mandate that school districts require sex ed and encourage students to question their parents on sexual topics. So we're, t- we're weaponizing these little critters, sending them back to mom and dad, and demanding to see what's vibrating in mommy's desk drawer. That's what's happening now. Topics explored in the kindergarten through 12th grade sex education curricula are all being implemented now in California schools. And the way we want to frame this, though, for parents to understand is it's not law in that they have to teach very specific things. It's more like uh, how Alex Newman had explained back in May when you guys first talked about this. It's a, a pick your poison mm-hmm. sort of thing. So there's like 700 pages as pages of the Healthy Youth Act, and it mandates teaching of certain things like um, LGBT as heroes, like Harvey Milk and all these other ones as heroes, so certain things are mandated, and the other ones, it's like, pick your poison, do you want A, B, C, or D to to give to the students, and it's just all bad. None of it's good. Well, and again, as we've said many times, almost 95% of this has nothing to do with actual biological sex. It's sociology, it's, you just mentioned this, history. We're going back now, and we're retooling, maybe I should shouldn't use that particular image. <laughs> we're going back now and we're retooling history to make it seem like the, the glorious achievements of Western culture for the past 2,000 years were all implemented by transgender people. Yeah, and what's happening in it, at the various school districts, it's almost like schools have choices, but the choices, again, are all poisons. So we had one parent named John Andrews of the Marietta School District. In his specific school district, they decided to pick their curriculum as the 
Positive Prevention Plus Sex Ed Curriculum. Doesn't that just sound good? Positive Prevention Plus. And this curriculum contains explicit photos and drawings of sexual activity. And we have images that you can actually take a look and see what it is. Well, there it is. Look at that little boy. He's sleeping in his bed and he can learn about penis perils. Number two, bendy ones. Well, isn't that a great image? Yeah, you're really taking time in California public schools to describe the fact that the male apparatus, the male genital ta- genitalia, might curve or bend or Thank lean to the side. This is the kind of stuff that they're doing. And, and what, what always creeps me out is they're always showing pictures like that. They're drawing pictures of little boys and little girls in beds and in, in, on the backside of couches doing all sorts of things like this. Really creepy stuff. And, and that just goes to show you, too, this is not – pitched for just college or high school juniors and seniors. I mean, it starts at kindergarten, this paradigm, and works all the way through high school. Well, and one thing is this, uh, this parent, John Andrews, he said, they talk about anal and oral sex as an alternative to regular sex because you can't get pregnant. Let me stop you there for a second. This is a direct quote, right? Yes. They, they talk about anal and oral sex. They don't talk about it. They promote it. Yeah. That they're, they're, what they're basically telling kids is, hey, if you want to avoid pregnancy, right, if you want to avoid that, consider anal intercourse or oral sex. This is, so they're, they're recommending this as, quote, unquote, a less dangerous, less potentially consequential form of sex. And the, I mean, the way they for, uh, form it is it's an alternative, man. It's just something different to this regular sex. That's how the, it reads. And you can imagine a California person saying it just like that, man. It's totally just alternative. Dude, when you're Dude. on your board having sex out this there, there's some tasty waves, man. It's alternative Shh. sex. Exactly. All right. Uh, Andrews also says they talk about mutual masturbation because everything mm. must be mutual. We have to have mutual. Uh, they discuss topics like role playing for different genders, blood play. Stop. Blood play. How to effectively and pleasurably have sex during a woman's time of the month. That's what blood play is. Onward we go. Dental dams. Fisting. Fisting. Is mentioned. What are those words? That should require no explanation if you have even a fourth grade imagination. Fisting. How to use your fist to pleasure someone else. Including, if you're a boy, your boyfriend. There we be. This is what we're talking about now for little, little children here. Yeah, and then one of the other things that you see is it's not just even about that. Let's take a look at what the lessons are uh, that they, they put <clears throat> out there. So just in the beginning of, of one of the sets of curriculum, there's, you know, you're going to talk about life planning and healthy relationships. And uh, just by lesson four, you get to learn about human trafficking because that's exactly what you should be learning about in the sexual health education for America's youth, for middle schoolers. Lesson four, right away, might as well learn about human trafficking. Well, and I love how all of this falls under the, uh, the, uh, the rubric of health. Explain to me how using your fist, explain to me how um, the kinds of the things that we've been talking about already, how these things promote healthy relationships. As far as the progressives are concerned, any kind of sex with any kind of implement in any kind of situation regarding any number of people is healthy sex if everybody in the room agrees to it. And that's a really dangerous precedent. Health, Health class used to be about how to protect yourself, to keep yourself healthy, to protect your wellness. Uh, it, again, if you're now telling kids that things like anal intercourse are safe and happy alternatives to to uh, regular sex because you can't get pregnant that way you are not promoting biological or bodily health in any way shape or form but it's staggering to me how they're teaching this stuff as it, they're convincing kids that not only are these things you could do things that you might do things that some people do do we are telling them now to be healthy you can do health. Being healthy means engaging in as many of these things as you can. Yeah, and of course, that's the positive. That's the, the positive. Sex positive, right? Yeah, and that's that's what I want to say. Is remember uh, the positive prevention plus is one of the curriculums. You also have I'm not sure if it's pronounced cardia or cardia. They have their own set, and of course, Planned Parenthood oh. has their filthy grubby hands all over this. They have their own sex ed curriculum that oh wow, look at all these options that we get to choose. And between. let's not forget for Planned Parenthood, ripping a baby, an unborn baby, to shreds in the womb is a form of health care. Or after. Right? Or I'm after. Or if a baby survives that brutal process, then let it die. That's health to Planned Parenthood, right? And this, these are the people who are creating a healthy sex program for your kids in California schools. And you know as well as I do that liberal idiots in Illinois, Chicago, and in Massachusetts, and in New York are going to, how long before they bring this healthy sex-positive California sex curriculum to your kids in these other states?
Wow. I feel like you've read my mind. We're on the same wavelength because I was going to go there it's next. A sh- it's a short book. It's <laughs> <laughs> from you. Okay. So that's the thing that we need parents to understand. When we said we're talking about this being the episode about California, I know how many people are going to comment saying that will never happen in my school district or my state. But, oh, that's crazy. California, the People's Republic of California. Yeah, but it's happening in your state, and it's going to happen in your school. Yeah, district. let me. We re- cannot stress that. Enough. Let's repeat that. The, you can no longer pretend that what California does isn't going to affect you. You can no longer pretend. Calif- Planned Parenthood is subsidized to the tune of five hundred million dollars by the federal government of the United States in every state across the country, right? The idea that you're going to avoid this, that your little school in Tennessee or your little school in Louisiana or your little school in Denver, Colorado is going to avoid this is utter nonsense. You have got to wake up and recognize that you fight this in California or you fight it in your Midlands, your homeland. Well, and what just happened at Planned Parenthood with the president? She got kicked out for not being radical enough because, oh my gosh, she's a doctor and Maybe there was even just, just one little line she went across, and that's not good enough for them. An Asian-American minority <laughs> doctor female. In, ch- female in charge of Planned Parenthood who is scalpel happy when it comes yep. to aborting babies, literally considers it to be the highest level of health care a woman can get to destroy the baby in her womb, was fired because she wasn't adamant enough that men can get pregnant. This is healthcare in California, right? Health, sex education. Men can get pregnant, and if anybody says different, they're being unhealthy. Yeah, but I'm the parent, so I can opt out of this, right? Is, no, that, is that possible? No. Can I opt out? Glad I'm you, the parent. I'm glad you asked it, Lassie, because <laughs> the answer is nay. nay. Nay opt out, right? It's no opt out allowed. California sex indoctrination. Uh, quote, to reassure concerned parents, the law, the law does allow parents to excuse their child from all or part of the, co- the comprehensive sex health education. And even HIV prevention. So the only things you're allowed to opt out are of are things that potentially might be useful, like how to prevent HIV. You can opt out of that, mom and dad. But what you can't opt out of is the instructions, materials, presentations, or programming that discuss gender, gender identity, gender expression, sexual orientation, discrimination, relationships, or family. So the thing that you, in the, that which in the 1970s would have been sex ed, biology, venereal disease, right? Pregnancy, sperm and egg. That you can opt out of, mom and dad. But you can't opt out of all of our indoctrination and our brainwashing and our Chinese water torture drip, drip, drip of all of this excessive gender nonsense. And of course, this is not just going to be sex ed within the sex ed class. This is going to be sex ed wherever they can put sex ed in the name of we're talking about gender or we're talking about gender identity. Well, it's a gender expression issue here in history class, so we need to implement this. Or, oh, we're reading a book in literature class. Oh, wait, they won't read books. We're reading this passage, this poem uh, in, in literature, so that's going to be the sex education. And in science. And math. And in math it's, and it's in sociology. This, in order to do this, you have to use class time every day in all of these subjects to keep bringing this stuff up again and again and again. Yeah, and we want you to take a look at uh, a video, a very short clip of something, a a very specific uh, example here. It happened at the Riverside County Board of Education public meeting, and there was training happening um, with members from American Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU, and they were, it was an undercover video, and it's them explaining basically how districts can cut out parents from from this whole process. So listen to what the uh, ACLU attorney, Ruth Dawson, had to say. Regardless of how old the student is, they can walk into a doctor's office and consent to these services without parental consent. Um, Those services are pregnancy and prenatal care, contraception and emergency contraception, abortion. um, And so for these, there's no parental notification. I think, I think a good way to think about all of these is these are just services that California has decided are so important that we're going to allow minors to be able to go into a doctor's office and consent to these services um, because they're just that important and students really need to be able to access them. And, you know, they're very sensitive in terms of a lot of times students don't want to talk to their parents or guardians about these kinds of issues. So let me hit you with that quote. Quote, regardless of how old the student is, they can walk into a doctor's office and consent to these services without parental consent. A six-year-old, an eight-year-old, a 12-year-old is going to be facilitated 
to do these kind of things, right? Yeah. For continuing the quote. Those services include pregnancy, prenatal care, contraception, emergency contraception, and abortion. And do you remember, Katie, when the ACLU used to be defending constitutional rights? Now they are 100% in on promoting abortion on demand. They're now 100% in on empowering underage children to defy, ignore, neglect, reject, and utterly betray their parents with the help of state schools. And it's because they need the next generation of these people to be the walking, talking mouthpieces mm -hmm. for this American Civil Liberties Union, as they were once called. But the thing that they're talking about, too, is that they're defending on behalf of the students. Well, it's, it's hard for some of our students to talk to their parents or their guardians about these issues. So clearly it's our duty to implement this information to them, that we're supposed to give it to them. No, you're not the parent. That is not your job. Uh, no, it's not your job, and it's none of your business. And if we lived in a sane and sober society, uh, the, collectively the American people would rise up and tell the schools, back off, right? You don't have the right to do that. But this is one of the problems with public schooling in general. We have, uh, over generations, decades and decades and decades and decades, going back to the 19th century, we've indoctrinated the parents to believe that the schools know better than we do. Well, gee, the teacher says we need to do this, so we do it. We need this, you need that. The teacher said we have to have it or we can't send the kids to school. We've become absolute cowards. With the, uh, and not only cowards, but craven in our unwillingness to be responsible for our kids and their education. This is their education, right? The, the schools, are, and we know from California, we, Alex and I, Newman and I did a show a couple months ago, which demonstrated how California high school graduates are among the worst in the country in terms of their ability to read, to write, to do math. Uh, African American males who graduate from California schools are infinitely behind. It's shocking and scandalous how they can't even uh, uh, educate their own minority students who they keep bragging about. And yet, Yet all of this is going to be in situ, right? Instead of worrying about why, we, why Johnny can't read or Jamal can't read, we're instead going to fill their heads full of this garbage from kindergarten through high school, which is only going to make their academic achievement worse. Talk about well, reverse priorities. Well, and then in this, that same vein, in terms of statistics about what our kids do and don't do, a UCLA study, and you, I think you and Alex <laughs> talked about this as well, found that 27% of children in California from the age of 12 to 17 now identify as gender non-conforming. And that is from the most recent data, which is actually a couple years old at this point, but that's the most recent data they have. You can only imagine once this goes in, fully implemented the way it is, there's going to be even more because that's what's going to be trendy because they're filling their heads with this nonsense instead of right. how to count and read. Criti and critical thinking. <laughs> Stop it. And what you're doing is you're telling these kids from the moment they set foot on your, your, your kindergarten campuses, their, their, their day schools, the moment they get there, they're being told that, hey, if you're a girl who thinks you're a girl, you're a little bit backwards, you're a little bit oppressive, you partici participate in a culture of oppression against transgender people, all the little carrots, all the gold stars, all the little stuffed toys go to the kids who are brave enough to challenge their own conception of gender. I, I predict within 10 years, if nothing happens, 50% of California school kids will, will think they're transgender. I'm actually being more... Or, or non-binary. Non gender non-conforming. Uh, I'm going to be more pessimistic than you. I'm not even giving it that long. Mm -mm. Seven years. I'll go seven years. And bef before we wrap up this little uh, d depressing little segment here, uh, we also know now that in the new law, the, uh, according to the AC uh, ACLU is bragging about this, by the way. The, why is the ACLU involved in what these public, why is Planned Parenthood involved in how this works in public schools? But they are. Can you imagine if the National Rifle Association and uh, uh, Lila Rose's pro-life organization was designed, was using public school time and money and facilities to promote their own particular brand of things. Here's why we got to have gun education for kids as young as five. Here's why we've got to have a pro-life. It would be, this would be a front page news scandal. The United, the United Nations would be investigating us for that. But here you go. Not only on top of all these other things, the ACLU is bragging that abstinence only instruction is not permitted. So you're not just allowed to tell kids that you're only safe if you just don't do it. Can't do that. Not permitted. And there will be no entertaining of any religious, read in quotation marks, moral worldview perspectives when it comes to this behavior. So all of this advocacy for radical progressive sex education is okay. That's not ideology. But the ideology of religion or morality, that's ideology. And we will have none of that.
Well, and that's why, I, I mean, you, you've said many a time here how public schools, but this is not just affecting public schools. This is affecting mm -hmm. all of the schools. So, again, in the comments section, when everyone's saying it's not coming to my little small town or it's not coming to my Christian school or it's not going to happen at, well, we're going to a charter school, so this won't happen. It's happening. And we have a specific example that happened in January of this uh, past year. In, it happened in Northern California to a, um, it's actually a Christian boarding school in rural Northern California. It's called P uh, Riverview Christian Academy and Pacific Justice Institute is actually defending them now uh, with a lawsuit because an actual raid happened on their campus. There were 16 armed law enforcement from the California Highway Patrol, two canine units, and 17 social workers who basically just came down to this campus. They were served a warrant and they had the right to search everything, all the records of all the students. And a lot of the girls, especially who were on campus at that time, were nervous, upset, confused as to what's going on. And the state later admitted that the raid was actually prompted by an internet rumor that was put forward by an online left-wing tabloid <clears throat> BuzzFeed. The state was duped into thinking that the school housed illegal drugs, they stockpiled weapons, and they were preparing for an end times apocalypse. And yet this Waco-style raid actually turned up zero amount of evidence. This is so this is happening, and this happened. And, and of course, even though the state said, yeah, oops, we, we were duped. They still uh, doubled down and they imposed a daily fine of $200 to the school because we got to shut them down. So in spite of the fact that the raid was triggered by a left-wing rumor, a, a SWAT team descends upon this Christian school, finds nothing, and it's California. They decide to find the school anyway. Worse than that, Worse than that is the fact, this is the state of California, where if you have illegal criminals, a illegal alien criminals in your state who are rapists and child molesters, you will not send a single police car to assist ICE into getting rid of those threats from your neighborhood, but you can expend the full force of your police apparatus to go after a tiny little Christian school. Do you begin to see where this is heading if we don't fix this? Well, yeah, and to make it even more context, this $200 fine they claimed was because uh, the state alleged that they were operating an unlicensed community care facility, even though they've operated for the past 25 years as a private school, and they filed an uh, annual affidavit with the California Department of Ed, as do other private schools and homeschools in the state. So even though they had all their paperwork in, they're just trying to find anything to make it so that you have to teach your sex ed because it's about the sex ed that that you know they're a christian boarding school so they won't teach at, or they do teach abstinence only and they won't teach this crazy left loony stuff the real the real bottom line motivation for this we've discovered uh, is the fact that the department of social services uh, and uh, and those who are behind uh, this raid uh, were actually wanting to shut this school down because they knew it was teaching from a Christian biblical worldview. Any Christian school, any home school that's done for religious or even secular reasons now, any left-wing organization can simply say, hey, I think the mommy in the next house is homeschooling her kids not to pr uh, promote homosexual lifestyles. This is the kind of stuff that can happen now. They're looking for reasons to crack down on Christian schools, private schools, home schools that aren't positively on board with this message. And since that's not depressing enough, if you're a teacher and you're not on board, you will have to take this sensitivity. You will be made to care. You will be made to care uh, in sensitivity training for teachers, even if you personally disagree. The LGBT sensitivity is mandated. It's a new bill, AB California. 243, again, California. We're gonna be saying a lot of different bill numbers, so look them up mm -hmm. yourself. This one, specific, AB 243, it passed 61 to 0, unanimous in the state assembly, and it's now headed to the Senate uh, Education Committee, where I'm sure it'll get it'll out of the committee and go unanimously. through, through the, the, the Senate, too. Saying It states that every junior high and high school teacher would be ordered to undergo training on how to support kids who identify as LGBTQ. That includes everything from referring students to activist organizations to launching school-wide efforts aimed at encouraging confusion like transgenderism. This is amazing here. They're, not only are they going out of their way to force teachers to make it a prim primary part of their job every day to cater to this relative minority of students, they are, by extension, demonizing the other kids, right? There's no, none of this is going on. Where, where is the, the mandated sensitivity for kids who can't read, for kids who can't do math? 
for kids who aren't getting an education. California doesn't seem to care the least bit about this. You know, as, as the poet once said, great 1970s poet, very forgotten, seems like it never rains in Southern California. Seems like I've often heard that kind of talk before. It never rains in California. But girl, don't they warn you, it pours. Man, it pours. That was beautiful. You should write that down. Make it a song or something. Maybe we'll sing that next time. Mm, that'd be great. Well, this mandated training is also going to put Christian public school teachers in the position of promoting and approving beliefs that clash with their biblical views. And that's stated by California Family Council's Greg Burt. Or Greg Burt. And he's absolutely true. If you're a Christian and you are a public school teacher, that used to be fine and dandy in the classroom you were you got along just fine but nowadays that you have to really stop and think about where your values are and what you're going to do now i understand what californication means the, the the peppers had it right californication those red hot chili peppers the, they, the, the, the thing something. about this the thing about this that is so disturbing and you, i could see some of our very serious listeners out there wondering why we're trying to make light of this. Because it's all you can do to stop from crying. It's all you can do from stop to stop from screaming. California is done. I mean, this isn't going to change. This is going to be the law of the land in California. If you're homeschooling your kids in California, move. If you're, if you're a business in California, you have to pay for this stuff, move. But don't bring California, Californication values to places like Texas and Idaho and Arizona and transform them into liberal cesspools. California is done. Stick a knife in them. Stick a fork in them. Stick a condom on them. Whatever you, however you want to phrase this in California-friendly terms. This isn't changing anytime soon. What we've got to do is try to figure out how to contain it and to not let this become the law of the land. You're correct. This is not the Beach Boys, as California as once was. Uh, one of the things they also say is that with this whole sensitivity training, elementary school staff are encouraged to help little children transition away from their sex assigned at birth. Elementary to their school. Affirmed gender. Affirm, tell me which elementary student, which kindergartner knows what the word affirmed means and gender for that matter. Um, and on top, or, and that was on top of already asking these same school districts to do away with, you know, the gender specific sports or restrooms or locker rooms. We can't have any of that. And of course, all of this is in the name of wanting to end bullying. Yeah, said the bully, right? Every bully I've ever met thinks that he's the victim. How many have you met? Many. <laughs> I'm sitting one, right, right next to one. She may be tiny, but boy, is she a pain in the butt. Mm -hmm. I will I tell you this, though. As far as uh, this goes, can you imagine a scenario where teachers now are being told they must be proactive, they can't be passive. Can you imagine in a, in a first grade class of six-year-olds, teachers now having to confront kids? Now, Jenny? Jenny, you know you're not, you know that gender is fluid, right, Jenny? Gender, I want you to affirm for me, Jenny, that you know that gender is fluid. Mm -hmm. Okay, Jenny, and you know, right, that to, to see the world only through the lens of your biological gender is, is bigoted, right, Jenny? Mm -hmm. Now, you want to be a good girl, Jenny, right? You want to be inclusive, right, Jenny? Mm -hmm. So are you yourself, do you, uh, even though you may have been born trapped in a girl's body, do you consider yourself just a girl, Jenny? Mm -hmm. This is what they're doing now proactively, right? This is the kind of crap that they're going to be doing. It's the suggesting. It's the enforcing. It's the transitioning, right? How, how, in, how dare elementary school teachers be empowered to help elementary school kids begin the process of transitioning anything? How about transitioning them from illiterate kids who can't read to reading kids? How about that transition? And it goes beyond our teachers, and now California lawmakers also want to force pastors to embrace the LGBT ideology. Uh, we're going to go back to the State Assembly of California, where their Judiciary Committee uh, passed Assembly Concurrent Resolution 9-9, and it's called Relative to Civil Rights, Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, or Transgender People. And it's a resolution that was passed telling pastors to affirm sexuality, despite it being a violation of biblical beliefs. It's one thing to tell your stupid paid government school teachers that they have to do something. You're now telling pastors by law that they are mandated to affirm, affirm, again, here's that word again, to affirm these things, you, despite what your faith tells you. And by the way, where is the, uh, I don't, were, were imams included in that? Is there, uh, 
Is, uh, do you see anything about I imams? I, I, I'm looking. No, I don't no. see imams. Do you see imams? I, I, can, no. Can, is there, is there no. fine print in there? Does, no, this, apply, there does this apply to mosques? Maybe. Nope. Have, don't see it anywhere in there. Cowards. Well, in the summary, they make, uh, the summary actually, this is, I, I copied it verbatim. Here it is makes declarations relating to the harmfulness and ineffectiveness of conversion therapy as a means to change sexual orientation and calls upon religious leaders and indeed all Californians to treat all people with understanding and acceptance. Right. So, so as Christians, we are called to, uh, to act as if satan Satanists are e on an equal plane, right? Uh, that as Christians, we can have our own revolting morality. We just can't teach it to our kids. We just can't ask to see it represented in the schools. And we have to pretend that the anti-Christian education that our kids are getting is affirming and inclusive. Yeah. In other words, stop being Christians. It, you're allowed to operate as a pastor in California as long as you're not a Christian. And what happened is they actually, they went in search. You know, they went in search of a pastor who was more liberal and thinking. Well, in and, California, you know, it wouldn't they, be much of a search. This is true. And they found someone. So they went mm. off of Dr. Kevin Manoa, um, He's a Zusa Pacific University chaplain and the former head of the National Association of Evangelicals. And basically, Liberty Council is saying that he became the prop for the LGBT agenda by directing pastors and counselors to reject biblical views. Again, he's a chaplain. Uh, ver so reject biblical views of sexuality and deny counseling for those struggling with unwanted same-sex attraction or gender confusion. So they found their prop, they went after him, and they, they put him in front of all the cameras so that he could say, yes, us in the religious community, we need to be more tolerant of, of those with different sexual beliefs contrary to anything the Bible may say. Right, and, and we've got a nice video on this uh, that talks that Roger Gannon, the Vice President of Legal Affairs at Liberty Council, explains just how crazy it is that you now have California government mandating what pastors, what religious Christian pastors can and can't do with regards to sexuality teaching. Just as an example, uh, it blames the church and religious leaders for the high rates of suicide among those who identify as LGBT. That's simply a false claim. Uh, it cannot be backed up empirically. And yet this resolution states it as if it's a fact. And this is exactly what they do. They'll just spew out some uh, accusation, like they said in this, that the, the high rates of suicide among those who identify as LGBT, it's all the, the fault and the blame goes on the church. But this is, this is amazing. what they do. This is amazing to me as a follow-up to that. So anything that happens negatively to homosexuals or transgender people is the fault of the church, right? And yet the church is not allowed to use church methods to try to address this. So we're telling pastors, you can't use spirituality, you can't use prayer, you can't use Christ, you can't use the Bible to try to help these people. You have to cease and desist all those things, or else we will blame you for everything that goes wrong. So on the one hand, you're not allowed to have any contact, you're not allowed to do anything according to your faith to try to address the situation. And whatever goes wrong with these people, you're still to blame anyway. That's kind of how that goes. Yeah, and that's yeah. That, and that's why they're trying to California state the state's trying to step in and say we'll solve the problem by making a law saying well you can't blame any of it. So you know there's that. And uh, now this bill is in the Senate, a Senate committee. So I'm sure it'll get passed. It'll very, pass. It, it'll get passed pretty quickly. Uh, well, let's move on, I guess, to California again. Um, could soon actually mandate that colleges we're going to go on the college campus provide services, extra services to illegals. So just more mandating. We already know about, you know, free college for everybody. Everybody gets college, including illegals. And now they actually want extra services. So California Senate AB 1645, look that one up, would require that each campus that's part of the California community colleges or the state universities ensure that it has a, quote, designated dreamer resource liaison. So you're telling me staff. that. With all of these scads of diversity officers making million dollars, ma making millions and millions and millions of dollars, paid way more than the faculty who have actual PhDs and have been working for dozens of years, now you have to have a specific academic position or uh, administrative position reserved for dreamers. Dreamer resource liaison. Are you kidding me? And hey, we think sort of spell out some of the things they're going to do and not just say, oh, they're going to be diverse and, and talk about diversity with campus. This person is, uh, needs to be knowledgeable in available financial services, social services, state-funded immigration legal services, and academic opportunities for illegal immigrant students. By the way, 
how much of this is dedicated to the actual California kids? What, what do they benefit from any of this? And, and what kind of things are you now providing for illegal immigrants that you don't provide for your own students? And you wonder why California system is broke. You wonder why California education has failed. You wonder why California kids can't read and write. And these are the kids who can't read and write are getting into these colleges, right, where, where you're not being taught. You, 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 all of the resources are going to these minority groups, these special interest groups, these victim groups. It is pretty staggering when you think about it. This is a... This is a sociological takeover of every aspect of education. Anything that touches, and, and you know, if I step back for a second, I was saying years ago when the Obamacare healthcare came, one of the big things that we talked a lot about before we even had a show when I was giving talks is how much of the Obama healthcare program forced things that weren't healthcare to become healthcare. I remember in 2011, 2012, 2013, talking to audiences about how certain aspects of the Obamacare healthcare law actually are turning schools or educational facilities into adjuncts of health, right? This is a classic example of that. And it's not just in California where, where the schools now have to become adjuncts for all these pet causes. But so too now the churches and the pastors are being lectured that your job is to facilitate our radical progressive secular worldview. And if you don't, we're going to punish you. Well, my question is then if they have these dream resource centers, are they going to be segregated off? And it, it, what are the requirements for you to be able to go in and get these support services, which include but are not limited to state and institutional financial aid assistance, so if I'm a, a resident of California, can I just go in there and try and get some state and institutional financial aid assistance, academic counseling, peer support services, psychological counseling, academic re opportunities, referral for social services, and state the, again, the state-funded immigration legal services. What is it that if I'm an actual resident of California paying tuition, I look at my neighbor here who's an illegal immigrant student, all of the things that they're getting versus all that I'm paying for. Why wouldn't you renounce your citizenship? Absolutely. And become an immediately an illegal alien. Why wouldn't you immediately renounce your citizenship, right, and then be spared the cost of tuition potentially or have somebody else cover it for you to be given all of these perks, to be given preferential treatment, to have your own administrators whose job it is to solely look after you? Why wouldn't you? If you can you imagine if you're an out-of-state resident, uh, like somebody who lives in Nebraska or Kansas or Wisconsin who wants to go to school in California, I don't advise it, but if you wanted to do that, I mean, you're paying out-of-state tuition to fund this stuff. Why, why wouldn't you just renounce, A, renounce your citizenship, and whatever state in the union you, you come from, just immediately show up in California's door for the, with, your, with your little pennant and your little going back to school bag and say, I am now a citizen of California. Let me pay California fees. And I'm also an illegal citizen of California, so give me my goodies. And uh, contrary to what Genesis says, it's no longer that uh, difficult to be an illegal alien. Oh, I so, thought you meant the Bible Genesis. No. The oh, band. you meant Phil Collins Genesis. Philip, Sir oh, Philip. Okay, Sir gotcha. Philip Collins. Gotcha. Jeez Louise. Anyway, one thing I want to mention about this bill, which already passed the assembly 60 to 40, 14, 60 to 14 in May. Uh, from the bill, they actually mention President Trump has threatened to deport deport millions of undocumented immigrants and it is imperative now more than ever to provide these essential resources to our students on all college campuses so president trump promised to enforce federal law and because of that we have to make sure that we give everything to these people we can who are here illegally that at the correct. expense of california and american citizens california yeah. love that's right california right there. love there you go it's all about that and our uh, next story uh, is also from California, of course. Bill requiring colleges to provide taxpayer-funded abortions or abortifacients, right? So California bill requiring this state Senate bill 2424 passed the California State Assembly Higher Education Committee. The bill will require all colleges, all college campuses in the state to provide access to abor abortion-inducing drugs on campus at no cost to students who are up to 10 weeks pregnant. Well, no cost to the students at the time of the abortion, that is. Former California Governor uh, Jerry Brown actually vetoed a bill that was like this back in 2018. And back then, I mean, if you remember California Governor Jerry Brown, he's kooky enough. Yeah, and if, if he even vetoed it. If Moonbeam, <laughs> if, yes, if Moonbeam, if Moonbeam <laughs> thought that this was too extreme and I unnecessary, yes. I mean. Um, he, and he says um, that it was unnecessary. Now you got Gavin Newsom, who's like, 
woo, we're going to support this and we're going full fledged. Mm-hmm. I will sign this. New age hippie, <laughs> hi, new age hipster Moonbeam. Yes. Moonbeam Jr. Yeah, exactly. Um, so they're, they're saying that they will provide this access. And, and I want, as someone who's currently pregnant, this hits me a lot harder than it used to. It's a lot more relevant to me. Um, the fact that they're going to give. Just to women, I guess. I mean, women. No, men, men can get can pregnant. Get to, yep. uh, so, men must have access to abortive fashion. So I guess, yes, uh, these men and women, um, they're getting this these abortion-inducing drugs on campuses. At up to 10 weeks pregnant, you are, like, there's a baby in there. And there, I can't stress that enough. There is a baby in there. And anyone who has done any research about what abortion-inducing drugs do, um, to put that on a 20 year old to a 21 year old they already don't know what's happening how to about them. 18 like, and I 17 year olds yeah if there will be 18 year olds on campus i uh, this story like hit home with me and it's just frustrating and saddening to me all at once and for 18 to 22 year olds i guess to be encouraged to do this is just beyond sickening well family research council's director of life culture and women's advocacy patrina mosley said that she spoke out against this bill in a publication entitled California's Campus Abortion Mandate is a Bad Model Legislation. She says, quote, the state of California is vying to be the first state in the nation that would force, force institutions of education to become abortion facilities, forcing pastors to agree, forcing teachers to be trained, forcing children to undergo this, right? The state of California is vying to become the first state in the nation that would force institutions of education to become abortion facilities with no safe safeguards for protecting taxpayer dollars. Quote, chemical abortions are traumatic multi-day processes that come with a risk of serious adverse effect. No dormitory community is prepared to handle the liabilities that such a mandate creates. The physical and psychological health of women is at considerable risk, and no state should consider it fit for model legislation. So they've already given up on California, right? Don't you? All she's, she's begging other states not to pick this up. And we go back to the question we said before. Notice her, a, a woman's psychological state, the state of her body after taking these toxic chemicals, all of this is not health. That is n- nothing to do with health. Health is the mother's right to destroy what's growing in her body. That's health. Well, we've had a lot of serious stories today. And uh, in the state of California, if you're going to be in the state of California, there is nothing more serious to all of them than the one thing known as manholes. So in true California style, dude, we're going to talk about Berkeley and how they're switching to gender neutral language involving manholes. So it's no longer a manhole. It's a maintenance hole. Dude, you're scaring me. You look like a, a, a hobbit version of David Lee Roth. That's just what I look like. That's all right. And, and so, when I go back, manholes. So manholes now have to be called? Maintenance, maintenance holes. holes. I remember about a, uh, six months ago when we were talking about progressives who wanted to stop calling vaginas vaginas. Of course. Because that was too gender specific. Mm-hmm. And so they wanted to call vaginas front holes, <laughs> right? Oh, As yeah, opposed to back, back holes. holes. <laughs> so we've got a situation now where the term manhole is offensive. Now, doesn't that offend women who want to be men? More facts from this story, because my eyes hurt now. Uh, the Berkeley City Council voted, of course, unanimously to revise the city municipal code, because this is what Berkeley does at their meetings. Dozens of terms will be revised, and the pronouns they and them will replace he and she, according to the new ordinance. Can you imagine being the, the person who has to go and revise all the municipal code because of that? I mean, I guess it gives them something to do. I would imagine it's a women's studies graduate who has no other employment, so she's gl- I'm sh- very glad to get it. Well, at least she graduated. But uh, Rigel Robinson is a member of the council, and he co-sponsored the ordinance, said in a letter to the mayor and the city council, in recent years, broadening societal awareness of transgender and gender nonconforming identities has brought to light the importance of non-binary gender inclusivity. And then on Twitter, Robinson added, there is power in language. This um, is a small move. But it matters. And what does it have to do with a 30, a 30 circumference piece of metal that covers a sewer? It, it doesn't. That's the point. It's, it does not. Our sewers gender. But there now. is power in language. We've got gendered and sewers now. it's a small now. move, but it matters. Maintenance holes. All righty then. I think after all of that, we've earned at least a few minutes of actual, true, real education. So let's wrap up things by taking a look at our nation's third president and architect of a little thing we call the Declaration of Independence. From our award-winning Presidential Minute series, here is Mr. Thomas Jefferson. Enjoy. Let me tell you a little story about a man named Thomas Jefferson. 
Born in Virginia on April 13, 1743, he would become the principal author of the Declaration of Independence. His family name and hard work prepared him to be one of America's most famous founding fathers. In addition to writing the Declaration, he was the first U.S. Secretary of State, the second Vice President, and third President. During his presidency, Jefferson brokered the Louisiana Purchase and the Lewis and Clark Expedition, who would have been completely lost if not for their faithful GPS, also known as Sacagawea. Tom co-founded one of the country's major political parties and is the only president to serve two terms without vetoing a single bill of Congress. He was an architect, inventor, lawyer, and founder of the University of Virginia, the only American university to be founded by a U.S. president. At 29, Jefferson married Martha Wales Skelton and together raised six children. Today, Tom's image can be seen at the Jefferson Memorial, Mount Rushmore, $2 bill, and the nickel. Let's face it, we all know Franklin got the better deal in the money department. Ironically, Thomas Jefferson died on July 4, 1826, the same day as John Adams and the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. And there you go, a little story about a man named Tom. And there you go, my friends. Every week, you're getting a little bit smarter here. That's what we provide at the Dr. Duke Show. And it didn't even cost you a dime or a nickel or a penny that actually has Abraham Lincoln on it. Anywho, next week, we'll be diving into the famed Battle of Bunker Hill in our award-winning Battle of America series. Now, show us that love. Support this show by subscribing to the Dr. Duke Show podcast. Give us the five-star rating. Leave us a nice comment. It's helping us to really continue to move up in the rankings. And that does it, man, for this week on The Dr. Duke Show. Don't forget to send us your questions for next week, dude. It's really hip and happening for Office Hours. For Freedom Project, I'm Dr. Duke. She's Katie. We're chilling here in California. We'll see you next time. And is it just me, or do I look, out, look like a bleached-out Geordie LaForge? <laughs> <laughs>